this challenging time, we created a special edition for this year festival with more than 90 exhibition in outdoor venue in the center of Tel Aviv and in rich online lecture program. I am so happy to open this session, cutting edge innovation in photography with our two expert guests, Canon technical expert, Michael Bernhill is in charge of the European technical support group at Canon and Daf Natal, Israeli Canon ambassador, a great artist using photography, video and sound her work has been exhibited all over the world, including the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And we too had the pleasure to exhibit a video at our previous festival. I really hope that we have a chance to see in, from her new underwater project too, today. And uh, the, the session will take uh, around 50, 45 minutes and then we will uh, take questions from the audience. And I hope you enjoy everyone. Uh, Daphna and Michael, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Eyal. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'll just load the presentation here. So we'll be speaking about what's new in photography in the last several years, in the last year, um, as well as speak a little bit about my work um, from the technical point of view, a little bit from the artistic point of view. And we also take a look um, behind the scenes of some famous photographers working with Canon. So this is again the content that I just mentioned. Um, in the end, we're going to say a few words about the future, um, what do we expect, um, or how do we expect cameras to develop in the next year, and have some time for tips and questions. So um, we'll begin with the latest innovation. Um, we'll focus on different topics that we found relevant, and we'll start with the focus system. Yeah, so I suppose it's a good time to start. Um, hello, everybody. Um, is you know, to talk about what is the difference and it, it sort of, I think obviously we get people get confused between what's a mirrorless camera and what's a DSLR. You know, some ways they look the same because people want cameras to operate the same. So the outsides are fundamentally the same, and what differs is on the inside. And you can see from these two diagrams is the cutaways. In a DSLR, you have a mirror that directs the light from the lens up into a, a prism that goes to your eye. So you're seeing the light directly through an optical system. Um, with a mirrorless camera, the uh, the one at the bottom there, the light goes straight through to the imaging sensor and therefore it's processed. Um, and this gives some advantages where it allows you to see exactly how the picture you're gonna take looks. So if you have it in black and white, you can see it in black and white. You can see if you're underexposed or overexposed, you'll see that in the viewfinder. Um, but with the DSLR, is you're getting a purer view, shall we say, and less what we call lag. So the light is going through the viewfinder at the speed of light. So some people prefer, still prefer this older optical system because it's more natural to them rather than looking at a very small TV screen. But the TV screen gives you certain advantages as well. Should we have a look at the next one? So obviously one of those are the, the auto-focusing systems. So um, what we've in Canon have sort of introduced over the last few years is what we call dual pixel. Um, and this basically, um, we now combine every single dot on an imaging sensor can also focus the light at the same time. So this gives us thousands of AF points across this imaging sensor and means we can focus anywhere um, you want in the frame. Previously with the normal camera, you could only focus around 40% within the center. Now it's edge to edge, it's 100%, and you can focus wherever you want. But what this really, really kind of does is it allows us to capture more information and actually analyze what you're taking a photograph of so the camera can actually see what the picture is and work out what the subject is. In the past, AF systems were really looking at 
the color so my red t-shirt you know it would know it's two meters away from the camera and it's red and it would see that object moving around but it wouldn't know what it was it wouldn't know it was a t-shirt it could be a parrot it could be a bucket the camera has no idea it's just a neutral object uh, but be it by analyzing from all however many megapixels the sensor has be it 20 or 45 the camera is getting a lot more information and it actually can start to make 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 a picture and recognize patterns of what the subject is and i think this brings into where probably the biggest innovation in sort of camera technology for quite a while is which is this sort of face and eye tracking and we have a little video which kind of um hopefully will play um you never know with the internet um and that kind of will show you hopefully um the system active do you want to show that yeah. So this is from a little video that Canlink made. So you can see, you know, and then it recognizes the person and then it sees their face. It can track their eyes as they're moving around. And what basically we can do now as well is the system, as it recognizes subjects, it knows a person. So for example, this figure skater, in the past, AF systems, the very basis of could recognize eyes, but it was literally looking for an oval shape object on a round ball so that could be a balloon or a football with eyes painted on where the technology is really late forward using what we call um, deep learning technology and this is an ai system that basically analyzes millions of pictures and starts to create uh, a pattern recognition system that we can input into cameras uh, and it allows them to recognize subjects to go ah i know what that is and i know what it's going to do therefore it's easier to track um, and this is really kind of what the big game changing thing is, because we've now been able to add animals as well as humans, um, because we're recognizing humans, not just by the faces, by their shape. So arms, legs, and the round thing at the top is bound to be your head. And I know anyone who normally takes a photograph, um, normally the face is the most important part. And that's just part of our human programming, shall we say. So when you look at a person, you always tend to be looking at their face. And that still applies when you look at a photograph. You know, the first thing you look at as of a person is the head face. So that's what we've had to train the camera to do. So the person might be wearing a helmet or goggles, et cetera, but you still want to focus there on their head. So for example, and this um, athlete here, when she span around, it still was tracking it, even though there was no face, because it knew the top bit is the head. And that's the bit that you'll look at. And again, eventually the base will come around and that will be the important part that you need to track to keep through. And we've applied that to animals as well. So it's very popular with wildlife photographers, especially bird photography. Bird photography can be quite tricky. Probably not the ideal place to talk about bird photography here, but, um, but yeah, birds in flight, notoriously difficult. You've got to um, see an object flying by and try to catch it in the center of your frame, put the AF point on it as it flies. It's, you know, we, we talked about this before, uh, Daphne and I was, you know, when you're taking photographs, you're, you're often juggling things, you're trying to do composition, you're trying to keep the AF point, you know, you're judging the right moment, etc. And what we're trying to do with this AF system is take away one of those balls in the juggling scenario, and you can then concentrate on the two most important aspects of photography, which is probably the decisive moment, capturing that moment where the action wants and the composition. And that's what really makes a great photograph not where it's focused, not where it's well exposed. It's roughly, you know, how does it look and what's happening? And is it the moment that tells the story? And we'll talk more about that later on, I'm sure. But obviously one of the, I think we were talking about this before, weren't we, Daphne? It was the, one of the, well, how is this possible? you know and i think the thing that drives this is not just the sensor the sensor technology has been around for we introduced it the basic technology in 2016 but it's handling that data you know and that's a lot of data it's like you know over 5,000 pieces of data and these cameras are taking 45 megapixels and at 20 frames a second it's juggling all that data and you need a process that can handle that data at the same time and that's where the big improvement has come with the new digit sort of processor that can handle that bandwidth of data and made this sort of ability to recognize subjects possible. Um, 
you know, it's part of Moore's law, you know, that the technology would eventually arrive and we kind of plan, but it's maybe making a device that's small enough and doesn't use so much power that you can put it in a camera and use it on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no point having a super powerful supercomputer that burns through batteries in five minutes. You need something that will, um, you know, you can take it into the remote fields and work, etc. There are obviously the discussions people say, well, oh, my phone has got AI, it's super smart. And you basically, yes, but your often your phone system is actually connected to a big server somewhere in sort of Silicon Valley. And that's doing some of the work. When you ask, you know, these assistants, Siri, et cetera, it's not in your phone, it's a big server somewhere else that's actually answering and coming back to a network. But when you're taking photographs, you don't always have the luxury of a network, especially again, talking about wildlife guys, you're in a remote field or you're doing photojournalist story, uh, networking capabilities may not always be there, but you still want that same level of performance. A camera just has to work. Um, yeah, yeah to, to sum it up, um, it just seems that the system is becoming much more sophisticated. Um, in tracking humans and wildlife and processing the data. And it just makes it easier for us photographers to handle complicated and difficult situations where before it was kind of hard to get the focus in place and to get all those different um, aspects of photography together um, when you have to photograph really fast or you have to shoot in very harsh conditions. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's just making you know, technology there to, to help in a good technology should be there to help rather than to get in the way uh, and, and that's what these two things but the problem with technology is it doesn't just um, arrive it takes time to you know mature and be available so this has been a sort of a bit of a long-term plan and 2020 was quite a big year for canon we obviously before all the uh, everything had happened the uh, covid obviously we had the olympics Normally we'd have what we call Canon Expo, which would be our big showcase of all our technologies. So Canon always had planned 2020 to be a big year. So we introduced our 1DX Mark III, which is the first camera to have some of this technology. And then later in the year, we had the R5 and R6, which took the net technology to the next level. But it obviously it's been a long time coming, but obviously it was always sort of planned. But again, just to show how well it was planned is like basically there's no point having this amazing processor unless you can get the data to it fast. And this is where another thing that we built into the sort of RF camera system is improving the data communication speeds, you know, by tens of times to be able to get data from the lenses, from the sensor to the processor fast enough. Um, and that's what makes the camera so speedy and relaxed. Because as I'm sure people have always used cameras or you've in the past where you, you press the button and just nothing happens, it just doesn't respond because the whole data system's like slowed down or backed up. And what you want to do is the system to be doing all this data in the background and be seamless. So therefore it doesn't actually get in your way and stop you from taking pictures or have to make you work in a different way. It should just be, I press the button and everything works as I expected to. And that's, that's when technology works at its best. And that's what we've been trying to do with the R5 and R6 build these structures into the system that we introduced in the EOS R back in 2018. So some of the technology in there was, you know, future design for the future that wasn't going to be maybe implemented straight away, but until the rest of the technology caught up with it. Yeah, responding fast to changing situation is such an important thing. I mean, I bet every photographer out there, whether you're shooting people or wildlife, had several cases where they kind of had this amazing situation in front of them and then the camera didn't focus or it just didn't work and um, the moment was gone. So this is super important. Yeah, you know, I've got I've got some small children and just keeping up with small children is probably the hardest thing of any subject. They, yeah, they never stay still, they're unpredictable, they are the worst of everything. And that, that really kind of, you know, the technology allows me to start taking nice photographs of them, you know, and that's um yeah that's a, a a testament to how far technology has moved over the years. So after the processor, I suppose the next big heart of a digital camera is the sensor. Um, and what's amazing about the sensor technology is yeah you know, though megapixels are going up etc. What we need to do is give you higher resolution, but also higher ISO performance. So less noise, more detail, but also bigger dynamic range it's often 
you know, at one stage it was all the internet ever talked about was dynamic range, you know, how many kind of, you know, how easy it was to recover images, what shadow detail, highlight detail. And we've been kind of expanding that kind of technology in our sensors recently. For example, having 10 bit HEF files, which are a new compression system that's basically uh, the way forward, or new video, et cetera, is using the same technology. And we've managed to introduce a new, almost, you know, the future of JPEG, really, which is much smaller size, but with more color depth, more dynamic range. But it's also that noise, high performance. You know, again, we'll talk about your project a bit later on, you know, it, where we're shooting in those low light conditions and where you know, high ISO performance, you know, is a, is a luxury that you would wish you had back then is that kind of having that ability to have low noise at high ISO. But I think one of the interesting functions that this, the three things we just talked about, AF processing and the sensor is almost like a triangle. They're all interlinked. They kind of come round together is that the low noise also helps the auto focusing as well, because the focusing is now on the sensor. So any noise you have in the signal affects your focusing ability as well, because it's, you know, it's like looking through a snowstorm when you're focusing. Um, maybe that's not probably a good example for an Israeli photo festival talking about snow, but you know what I mean? Uh, maybe a sandstorm, maybe, a, but so the noise actually gets in the way of the signal and that affects your focusing ability. But with the sense, it's very low noise for the focusing. And it's why we've managed to be able to achieve like minus six EV, and that's very, very dark. That's equivalent to if you go outside, you know, away from the city and you just have like a quarter moon, that, that's the only illumination you have, no street lights. Um, that's roughly six minus six EV and the camera can focus on an object. You still need some contrast, of course, you know, no camera system in the world can really focus without some sort of uh, detail to, to lock onto. Um, and I was uh, telling a story about how we, the very first camera we introduced, the R, had this minus six, um, and how technology can really kind of influence and change how people work and change people's lives. As one of our ambassadors, Daniel Etta, wanted to do a project in uh, Romania. He always wanted to shoot in a coal mine, but you know it was impossible because the light, the coal mines were so bad, and he really wanted to tell the story, but you can never really capture any images because it was so dark, and he. We told him about this, so we thought he'd give it a try. So he'd done projects around the pit, talking to the miners and showing the dilapidated states on the surface. But he actually decided to go down uh, this one time with his camera. And literally all the light they have are those kind of miners' helmets. And you could actually shoot in conditions where the, the, e the sensor could actually show you a picture. The EVF allowed you to actually see in the dark because the picture was amplified and the camera could focus in these low light conditions. And you could actually produce images of these terrible mining conditions. And then after he did this project, two weeks later, the mines collapsed and people, several you know, miners died. Um, but obviously the mining ministry hadn't done anything for years and didn't really kind of seem that bothered, but they, a, a protest started and there was images that Daniel had taken that showed the conditions in the mine, you know, you, you, it's very difficult to get a politician to go down a coal mine to actually get them to feel connected to it, you know. But then there were the images that everyone could see that they were sending their, you know, sons and daughters and you know, to go work down. So it was kind of super important that the story, this, this technology allowed a story to be told that actually changed how the mines in that sort of area were going to be governed and put resources into developing them again. So to sum it up, basically those new sensors are allowing us to capture images um, in much better quality, in very dark conditions, to enjoy better focus and not to compromise on the size of the file, which is... Yeah, and also important, also, you know, one of the things that's often forgotten about is uh, even better in, in brighter conditions as well. You know, the dynamic range means when it's sunny, you've still got details in your highlights and details in your shadow areas as well. It's not only, we're not focused on one area, with this new generation of cameras, we're looking at both ends because there are, you know, different photographers are working in different fields. So yeah, it's making all conditions, so we say. Um, next, we're going to see what's new with the lenses. Lenses. So yeah, obviously one of the advantage of mirrorless cameras um, that we had before, if you remember back at the, the start, uh, we had the mirror in the way. So, you know, a bit of history for you. When you have a lens number, that actually corresponds to a distance between 
what we call the nodal point, the center point of the lens and the sensor or the film plane. So if you had a 24 millimeter, it should be 24 millimeters from that point to the film. But when you've got a mirror, uh, mirror system that takes up 40 millimeters, the lens can't be 24 millimeters. So you had to design the lens in a way that pushed everything forward to, and still achieve the same result, which was a compromise in its optical design. Uh, but now by taking the mirror out, those rules are all ripped up. You don't have to design around the mirror box. You can put optics closer to the sensor. So this gives designers a free kind of world to look at what lens designers can be. And it doesn't have to be what it was before. And I think the three goals of our RF system were basically either create a new lens that never been done before, that uh, you know, better quality than ever done before, or create a lens that's you know the same but better performance or new technologies built into it, or create new compact lenses that never been done before. Yeah. So there's like four things that we could do. That you know, there were the four guidelines and. There are lenses like the new 800mm f11 DO lens, which is literally about this big, weighs less than a kilo, 800mm, about $900. You know, these type of lenses were just not possible before, or and now we've got a lens that you know is a bargain price that people can put in their bags, take to the field, and shoot at 800mm, because the AF system again can compensate for different apertures that wasn't possible with the DSLR. And we have lenses like the 24, 28 to 70 f2, which is amazing zoom lens a fast aperture but also optically the same as a prime lens you've got a series of prime lenses in one big zoom and it's amazing a number of, of our ambassadors have actually done one lens bag that's it i don't have to swap all the time yeah it's big and heavy but rather than carrying four or five lenses one is all i need and this image here is another technology that kind of um is beneficial we can now kind of put two motors into the lenses and they work together um, you know, why would you want that? Faster focusing is obviously one thing, but obviously one of the other benefits is video. Um, we see more and more operations of people using, doing stills and video. And one of the big difference between a still lens and a video lens is what we call focus breathing. Is when you change the focusing, the actual magnification of the lens changes um, because the optics are moving inside together. And therefore you get this pulsing and this is really this doesn't affect stills you never really bother you for stills but for video if you actually do it while you're filming you actually see the background kind of go and it's kind of um it can be quite distracting you know and that's where you have a, a proper video lens they're quite big and heavy because mechanically they're compensating for that but this is a new way of thinking we can do exactly the same by by using two motors and linking them together with a computer and actually going uh, if I focus here, then I can move the zoom to here to compensate. And these optics can actually move together smartly without you actually thinking, and therefore basically eliminate focus breathing. So you're getting almost um, cinematic kind of performance in a compact, simple lens, because these lenses are being used more and more by people who are doing both jobs. Obviously, um, oh, one slide to um, just quickly about the obviously one benefit of the the RF system as well is um it's it's a quite a new system to the world um, and we have to grow the lenses but obviously the EF lens is one of the most popular lens ranges ever you know we've Canon produced over 150 million of them and there's probably 140 e Canon lenses and then you add all the third party ones we're into like you know 300 million kind of EF lenses produced since 1987 it's you know rarely popular sort of lens mount it's used by cinema cameras and you know, all kinds of industrial stuff as well um, so when we designed a new system we didn't want to forget about those lenses because so many people have them and it's a you know it's a major blocker so what we did is we produce a series of adapters that connect the two lenses together so it's seamless but i think that my favorite part is the fact that i've christened it bilingual and as you'll probably know you know anyone anyone can speak two languages it's better than being able to speak one language. Um, so when you put an EF lens on, it talks EF language, so it performs exactly the same on the R bodies as it does on a standard EOS body. There's no translation errors. Most of these adapters have a little chip that translates for you. And you know, with any translation error, you can be complimenting someone's meal. And if you get it wrong, you basically insulted their mother. You know, it can be a small change in you know, the language and what that normally means in real world situations is that translation error means the camera locks up or the focusing doesn't work. 
by actually being native speaking, you don't get those translation errors. So therefore you have no lockup and the system works seamless as if it was, you know, we say, you know, people ask, does this lens work on this body, this ESR body, R5, R6? And the, the answer is, did it work on your EOS 5D3, 5D4? Yes. Well, that's the answer. It works exactly, if not better, than it did with your previous camera. I suppose the other big technology kind of what we're seeing now is the world has changed, so cameras have to change as well as how we share pictures. Um, you know, connect and share is what everyone does. You know, there are several ways, you know, you may do it just for want to put pictures on social media. You may need to send it for a client. You may need to send it for an agency. You've got an urgent news picture. And then you need to get those pictures off and sent straight away. And there are now more and more ways to do this. Um, what we've kind of kind of decided, often these systems are fixed ecosystem, shall we say, is to try to break out of that with our new kind of uh, image.canon system, which allows you to upload the pictures to our image.canon which then basically then hands the data over to, I don't currently we're doing with Google Photos or Adobe Creative Cloud. We also have Dropbox in the cameras as well. So it's not just like Canon system, it's about what our users actually doing. And it's, for example, the Adobe Creative Cloud, you could do a shoot, you could be uploading the images, then you could look at them on your iPad because they're in the cloud, you connect your iPad on Lightroom, they're in there, you can tag them, do some edits. And when you get home, you start up your computer, your Mac, and you log into your Creative Cloud account, and all those edits you did on the iPad are there. You know, it's there's no cards out of the cameras, there's no downloading and transferring. It's all seamlessly kind of on the move. It's all interlinking. You know, we are going to have our own downloader where you can upload it to the, the cloud, and then there's an automatic system that will automatically download the images to your laptop or computer at home. So when you get there there's no downloading, they're already done, you know, that kind of level of technology. So now we're moving to the gossip part. We're gonna gossip talk part. about some, <laughs> yeah, some famous camera kits of some uh, very famous Canon ambassadors um, that I'm sure um, all of you know. So um, maybe Michael, you can tell us um, how were you working with these photographers over the years? Well, uh, yeah, as, as um, working for Canon Europe, this sort of, I cover sort of um, EMEA sort of region. So everywhere from Iceland to South Africa, everywhere from basically technically um, Iceland all the way over to Vladivostok, but technically. Um, so, you know, Middle East, Africa. So we work of all ambassadors. And my job is to provide technical support, not just for Canon staff, but also for the ambassadors. And, to advise them basically what the equipment is. Um, and I think what's important to remember, a lot of these photographers are, they're not technical people. They're not about the gadget. They are creative people. That's what drives them is the, the art, capturing the image or telling a story. And the cameras are a tool to enable them to do that. And it's about informing them or uh, telling them which is, the, you know, helping them choose the right tool for the right job, shall we say. Um, because there's so many cameras and so many lenses out there, you know, you and that not everyone wants to carry every piece of kit. So it's like understanding what their requirements are. And when new technology comes along, you, you know, we're already thinking about, oh, that would be really good for this ambassador. That would be really good for that ambassador. Once you understand what their requirements are, and this helps us again, feedback to Canon Inc, our you know, design group, I and mean, what future products should be or needs to be, because you have a, a good understanding of how people are using the camera or what's missing sometimes that's probably more important or the, the, the negative side or the downfall that what it can't do but, but what it would be great if it could do that would open up new possibilities and then we give that tool to a great photographer you know like yourself and they will see those pictures you do later on that basically you know it's, they're not designed to do that but push the boundaries of what the technology is meant to do and use it for a creative field that the engineers had never thought of and, and it's always great to share that back with the engineers, show these pictures, and they they just blown away at what their hard work has allowed to do stuff. But for if we talk about Sebastian, for example, his kit is actually quite simple. Um, he's a literally a two-lens man. Um, if you look at his work, it's not shallow apertures, it's quite there's quite a depth to it. So he's shooting like five, six, f8, even smaller than that. It's all about 
showing the environment that the subject's in. He, he's not about doing fancy portraits. It's all about this is the person, this is the environment that they're in. And it, there's always a great depth to his images. So over the years, he's moved on to a 24 to 105 because it does everything he wants. It's sealed, you know, it's weather sealed. It's got all the focal lengths he wants. He also has a 70 to 300 for the slightly longer shots, you know. There is obviously a shot of a, I think it was a Jaguar in the, in the jungle again. 24 105 is probably not the ideal lens to get close to a Jaguar with. So the 70 300 is kind of in his bag. And he chose this one because it's quite compact in size and it's quite tough and he can leave it in his bag, carry it around. But he'd been using a 1DX3, again, this is a, and a 1DX2 before that. This is what we kind of helped him choose just because he goes to the rainforest and spends months in the rainforest, uh, which are very unforgiving kind of environments to cameras, the, the humidity, etc. And he needs super long battery life because there aren't many power sockets. You know, when the nearest power socket's a thousand miles away, you know, it's um, you need, you know, it's quite important to uh, have something that will last you a long time. Um, it's quite amazing how you know this famous photographers. Well, first, it was really interesting to hear from you as a technical expert how much you evaluate the artistic aspect and and how you know you're able to see that this is their bigger motivation and it's quite amazing that you know those um canon ambassadors and big photographers who could basically ask for and get any amount of gear they want end up using those very modest you know sets of gear um just one or two cameras um just two lenses that's that's quite amazing yeah, yeah, they're not what we call gear heads. They're not, it's, gear isn't important to them. It's about the um, what it can deliver, the technology. If it doesn't do something, they don't care if it's the latest technology. It's, does it add anything new? You know, they, get, they become comfortable with what they know. And that it's because it's a tool and it means they can focus on, you know, familiarity is, is much more important to many kind of photographers because you know how it works and I can concentrate on taking the image the technology has to offer something new. And we saw he, uh, Salgado was moving on to the R5s, for example, because of um, the viewfinder. He can see in black and white now. Yeah, and he can actually, the contrast and the lighting for black and white is very different from color. You know, how you would shoot black and white is, it's, it's all about the tones and the contrast is so much more important than color because, you know, you, what looks good in color can look terrible in black and white because it's, there's, the contrast is not there. There's no, this is just shades of grey um, and seeing it in black and white, you can kind of, he'll shoot raw and colour and process it later on through his normal sort of workflow. Uh, but being able to, you know, visualise black and white in the viewfinder is kind of a big kind of send because there's probably so many images that you've taken that and you kind of go and you convert to the black and white and you go, that's rubbish, you know, it doesn't work, you know, and he's basically a black and white photographer. He basically only shoots really black and white. That's what he's known for. And then we have Don McCullen, um, who's had, who just had, you just had that big solo exhibition at the Tate, which is yes. quite a huge honor um, for a photographer. Um, he's also a sir, just, you know, but yeah. um, so he actually um, moved into um, photographing color, right? Yeah, again, the move to digital kind of went, the obviously color was a, yeah, it's there on his fingertips because he, he's always been a darkroom person. So black and white was just natural that he controlled and edited. You know, processing color work is so much more difficult, etc. But when you start to get into color, it's on your computer. It's, it's much easier to kind of experiment with it um, and find his own way. And moving to digital opened up there. And Don is obviously um, one of his photographers who also does commissions as well. So. He's obviously renowned for his photojournalist work, et cetera, but he's also you know, a working photographer. So he has done commissions in color. And, and again, he often will use different products based on what the commission is about, you know, whether he's doing magazines or stuff like that, you know. But, you know, again, he's another guy who, you know, he, he started off with simple equipment. So he still uses simple equipment now. So fundamentally a 5D4 and a 24 to 72.8 is his main weapon of choice, but he still hangs on to the 51.2 and the 85, which taken back to the um, the older days when he was shooting with um, the other brands with um, you know, fixed focal length lenses. And that still gives him that kind of fast aperture kind of performance that he's kind of renowned for, shall we say. But again, he's one of those um, who's adapted to color um, with the change to digital.
And then we have Paolo Pellegrin, uh, who I'm sure I'm, I'm highly recommend you all go into their websites and check out their work. Um, so uh, he's the third one who also um, has a pretty simple kit. It's quite it's quite amazing to know. Yeah, well, Paolo's again maybe it's obviously um, more contemporary than the other two, and he does a lot more commission. So his kit does change from job to job. But again, he's not a big um, hoarder of equipment and, and gearheads. We do have some of our ambassadors, I will admit, we'll, who are total gearheads and they obviously ask for everything. Um, we've chosen three people who are who aren't here, but his his kit is quite simple. But he do he does commissions as well. He will do it for like you know fashion brands as well. He'll do like the fashion the campaign shoot. So he'll be shooting you know lot yeah large megapixel five uh, DSs. Then he'll go to a war zone. I remember we had to get ship him a camera out to. I think it was like Syria or something, one of the early kind of issues or um, Iraq when they were fighting the, um, um, what's it called, um, ISIS kind of, you know, the big kind of wave again. ISIS, need, he needed a camera out of there because he had to fly suddenly from one job to another and trying to figure out how we get a, a 1D Mark II all the way to uh, into the middle of um, <laughs> Iraq. It was not the easiest of logistic programs we ever had. Um, so he could shoot because he needed something with battery life, robust. He was, you know, on the move all the time. So that's the camera he wanted that he felt comfortable with. Um, because you, yeah, you know, again, when something happens, it happens and he needed something that wouldn't break down. But he's also been shooting video recently, you know, he's been moving around. So his equipment does change quite a lot. But he's again a simple man 24 to 70 lens, 35 mil, 1.4, 50 mil, 1.2 are kind of in his kit bag almost all the time and then other lenses and bodies will change based on what job he's doing really so um thank you for for sharing this again it's quite amazing to see um that you could do so much with the with the small and simple set of gear of course it has to be a really good gear uh, but yeah you don't need to move around with like five cameras and and ten lenses um, so I'm going to share um, a few of my works and uh, kind of take you through a little technical journey I had as well. Um, basically, my work um, is the exploration of the realm of thoughts and emotions. And this sort of interest kind of um, draws me to choose all kinds of challenging environments. For example, um, I spent several years with nuns and monks in our area. And I photographed only during nighttime with candlelight, which is almost like no light at all. So it was very, very challenging. Um, and at this time, um, again, the cameras did a great job um, with the low light, but I still I had to shoot um, sometimes close to a second on a very steady tripod. Um, ISO was many times 4000. Um, so in this case, I kind of used the grain and it looked nice on the prints that I made. Um, but yeah, cameras today are much less grainy. And I also um, used strictly manual focus to kind of lock on the people's eyes um, because the cameras um, didn't have the technology that they have today. But then later on, when I made a video project called You're Gorgeous, You're Mad, um, it was a sort of a series of confessions that um, a group of people made about what is it that they really think and feel about who they are. And I made, I took videos of them um, through a two-way mirror. So they're looking, in, looking at themselves from one side and I'm filming them from the other side of that mirror. And I was doing this while they were actually listening to an audio recording I made with them several days earlier uh, where they spoke about their inner thoughts about who they are. And work which was actually shown at the Israel Photo Festival last year. So maybe uh, some of you guys have seen it. Um, you see this series of um, video portraits. I'll just um, show you a little bit of it without sound on the background. If you want to see more, you can find it on my website. So in this case, um, again, the eye tracking, the eye tracking of the video system saver, and it was amazing. Um, so it worked automatically, and when you project it super large, 
sharp right there on the eyes where you need it. Um, this was an amazing feature to have. And then the, I'm working on a new video and stills project. Uh, half of it is going to be filmed on this clip in Mitzperamon. Um, it's going to feature an actress who's going to be hanging on to the edge of the cliff as if she's going to fall. Um, this part is going to be filmed with the R5, which is going to allow me a 4K 120 frames per second, um, so I could use a slow motion of her fall. And um, it's going to continue underwater. So I've been doing a lot of tests and taking a lot of photographs underwater um, to prepare for this. And uh, again, it's another, just like the extreme low light conditions I had working with the monks with those little candles and almost no light. Um, so here again, it's, it's pretty extreme conditions because um, what happens underwater is that, well, first the white balance um, goes crazy and you lose a lot of red color. Um, the deeper you go and then you have to handle, you know, yourself in the water and the model and a lot of other features, which makes it harder to juggle all those different um, aspects of photography that you need to handle, um, just like Michael mentioned before. So um, actually taking a mirrorless camera into the underwater is, is a huge relief. I kind of want to explain it in a very a simple way. Um, I bet many of you know exactly what a mirrorless camera is, but just for those of you um, who are not on the same page. So um, up until mirrorless cameras, like DSLR cameras, what you would see um, through the viewfinder is exactly what you would see with your eyes, basically. If it's dark, you would see uh, the dark environment um, through your frame. But let's say you would take kind of a longer exposure and expecting to get kind of more light from your scene, you wouldn't see it from the viewfinder. Um, you would only see it later after you captured the image. And with a mirrorless camera, um, you don't see what your eyes see in the environment, but you see how the picture or the video will come out with the specific um, exposure and setting that you choose. So that makes it way easier for me um, to work underwater and to, to see my setting, you know, through all this um, moving uh, water environment. And um, yeah, I've been avoiding using flash up until now because I really love capturing all those rays of light. And uh, focus, again, is a, is a big issue. Um, and I, I can't wait to get the R5 underwater. Um, right now I'm working with the EOS R. Um, and then really examining you know, that shift um, it made with the ability to track a human body in much more sophisticated ways, which means that even if you don't see their eyes, um, it would track the, the shape of the body and focus right there. So if you want to follow up on this project or other projects, um, you could check my website or my Instagram page. Yeah, as we said, it's just that, that ability, especially on the water, you're having to do so many things on top of not just frame the subject, you know, you're, you've got all your breathing, you've got the model, you know, you've only got limited time to get the shot as well. So just having technology just take, I suppose, one bit of pressure off you to uh, use excuse the pun um to kind of make easier shooting on the water this, this makes life so much easier because you've only got limited time to get some of these shots i suppose you know well, how long do you quite take amazing to... how fast people are moving underwater like you you have a brief of a second like it's a really small part of time um to capture the specific moment you're looking for and i guess the, the lung capacity as well that kind of limits the number of you know how many shots you could actually do before you have to do a reset yeah, so therefore each moment is kind of quite crucial. Yeah, absolutely. So again, technology is just a huge help and it, you know, it makes it more fun because there's like, there's no end to how much you could work with your models and how much you can direct them and the fun things you can do. Um, and again, the less you have to, you know, work around all those technical issues and the faster you do that, the more time you have to, to play around and create new and fun images. I think that's a great phrase, the, the word fun. I mean, taking images, if it's, it's not fun, then obviously, yeah, then it, it becomes a chore and 
it takes the joy away. You know, the best photographs that you enjoy that kind of to have it, you know, maybe not all the time. If you're telling an important story, perhaps, you know, that kind of um, that isn't kind of, you know, that isn't inspirational for, you know, because of tragedy, etc. But for sort of personal projects, they should be kind of there to, you know, you know, a moment that you enjoy that makes you reflect if it was a chore or you kind of go, why did it do that? That took so long. Then that's, you know, something's gone wrong with the whole project. Yeah, it's not, yeah. not, not yeah. really what you want to be involved with. So maybe like about the future, um, what's coming? Well, you can you can only talk so much about the future. Obviously, I can't give any secrets away. Um, but I mean, the future is well. I think what we're seeing in the future is a greater integration of stills and video. I mean, we're looking at more and more markets and how agencies and people aren't employing photographers or videographers. They are employing content creators or media creators, someone who can do both jobs. That ability to do both things is super super important going forward um, it's not just yeah there's going to be less I suppose less still users and still video and a large middle ground of people who can do a bit of both like yourself you know because you know commissions clients always want more and more because we, how we communicate you know there's with all these lockdowns again a lot more video has been shared than ever before um, and stills are fantastic and they can tell stuff but video can also tell the stories and there's just demand for both kind of contents. We'll see more and more people combining them together. Um, and I suppose the other big thing that we talked about was the AI in the, the AF system, but that will continue to be developed. There'll be more sort of AI systems to recognize more types of subjects. So, you know, currently we're focusing on what is the main most popular subjects, but also AI is going to affect us in other areas as well. In your post processing, you know, um, you talk about high ISO. So, you know, using AI to reduce noise before the noise processing is quite dumb. It applies a basic noise across the whole frame. Reality is, you know, you have a plain wall and lots of detail and over here. You don't want the same level of noise reduction because it kind of smears all the details. You could actually start to apply noise reduction in different ways, the different parts of the image to give you a more natural. Uh, superior image and to understand what you're photographing as well you know cataloging images you mentioned you know when you download your images that the system can you go for a coffee or something and come back and the system has kind of cataloged the images for you recognize what they are and actually started to tag them so they're easy to find in your database i know it's just sorting out the good from the bad you know these are these ones are you know part of any sort of shoot is culling the images going through the images uh, you, know, you have a system that actually starts to highlight these are the bad images, these are out of focus or something's wrong with these, and you can go through those later on, and you know, it just helps speed up workflows. And that's obviously one of the more important for many photographers is taking the images great, but going to do other stuff, the admin work and sorting out the images, that's sometimes the biggest pain. Taking the images is wonderful, it's so much fun, but actually having to cull them through, get down, can be a less fun part of the business until you actually get down to the actual final images. And I think that's um, where AI and these sort of technology will revolutionize most photographers' lifestyles, giving them more free time to do things they like to do. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds fascinating. Um, we have like just a few moments left basically for um, tips, questions and answers and Maybe I'll just mention that we kind of both discussed it previously and, you know, um, kind of agreed about photographers um, having to find this balance between, you know, technical experience and understanding and then artistic development. So like personally, I would just like to encourage everyone not to give up any of these sides, like, and kind of move from where you're comfortable to where you're not. So let's say you're tech savvy, uh, but you don't know that much about art or maybe you, you kind of, always wanted to push your work um, further in that respect. So, so do that, you know, go into where you're not comfortable or if you're, you know, very artistic but you feel there's a lot of technological issues that you don't understand, it's not such a big deal. You know, um, you learn and, and you get it and you try things out and it's, it's not as difficult as it seems. No, um, and then there's plenty of, you know, the internet allows us plenty of people to give advice, you know, can kind of have support lines, et cetera. There's lots of um, ways to learn how you can use the technology. 
to benefit uh, yourselves. And you know, in the past, there was always, a, you know, the technical block, often it was a mental block for people going, I can't achieve the results of these photographers. You know, I don't have the, I'm not as technical as them. As we said before, some of the greatest photographers aren't that te- have never been technical. They are you know, inspired, the creators, the artists, it's having that creative mentality is more important than the equipment. The equipment is this, then the tool, the paintbrush or the pencil that allows you to deliver the results. And some people just maybe, you know, understand the ins and outs, but again, these things can be taught or you learn, but yeah, it, unless you have the creative side to start off with, it's, you know, you can't read, that's the most difficult part to teach. But then I do want to say that, um, you know, when you go into more technical understanding, what's nice is that it allows you a greater freedom. You're much more free to express your ideas. You, you, you have more ways, um, you know, to use every situation and to illustrate it in any way you want. Mm. Again, you know, it just goes back to what we mentioned before. And um, since we just have a few more minutes, so I wonder if, um, Eyal, if there's any questions that you I wanted saw, to bring up. I saw one question about the EOS utility. That was actually released last week. Um, it's available on the um, most of the Canon sites across EMEA and America. So we released it for Mac and for Windows. The full versions were released um, last week. We had the beta version previously, but the final version is uh, now available that supports more practically, you know, quite a few kind of our EOS cameras. The list is almost too endless to kind of name and many of our G series cameras as well. Uh, so the second question is about the uh, connection between the uh, mobile and the camera. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can see it. The... Have a look. Um, uh, let's have a look. What else we got? Yeah, well, obviously, um, the difference between a mobile phone and a camera. Obviously, um, the obviously mobile phones obviously are trying to replicate some of the functions that were already into a camera. So the fact that the cameras are, often have large sensors, so and zooms and all this sort of technology is already part of a camera. So they're trying to make these functionalities in a phone. So there's a lot of uh, technology to replicate what's already there. Um, but also the connectivity between the devices is kind of improving all the time. And obviously the new generation of Bluetooth, for example, uh, makes pairing between the camera and the phone so much more seamless. Um, and our, obviously our, our connect, camera connect app connects via Bluetooth and then leaves the two devices always connected. You can connect more than one camera to the app and vice versa. Uh, and then obviously when you want to transfer images, Bluetooth is wonderful, but it's quite slow. Uh, and images, especially when you've got something like 45 megapixels, downloading it to your phone would take a long time via Bluetooth. So we have a system where we kind of have to link into the Wi-Fi, but obviously there are security measures within any phone system on for Wi-Fi, so people can't hack your phone. So we have to go around the follow the protocol of those systems to connect in, and that takes a little bit of time for it to kind of for the Wi-Fi. Well, only a few seconds, but you know there are security profiles within the phones that we can't just kind of bypass. That we have to kind of follow um, the handshake policies, etc., to allow the devices to connect. Um, but yeah, the the whole connecting to phones is. Obviously, it's super important uh, because the phones are now, you know, it's so important to our lives. It's one of our central connection points. And we are working on improving how the phones and cameras connect to these systems. Um, because in, in the modern generation, a few seconds it feels like hours for the older generations, you know, uh, on, a mo- on a mobile phone. So, yeah, it's super important. So there's um, a question of um, the gear I'm using for underwater photography. So currently I'm using the EOS R, the Canon mirrorless with a Nauticum housing and very soon I'm going to be using the R5 and I'm using it with a 1635 lens. Yeah, it's probably important to remember for on the water, how it, the water distorts the image. Therefore, it's always, yeah, you always need to always go wide and then you expect, you know, those kind of lenses are, are kind of it's super important. 
Daphne and Nigel, I'm sorry, but we must uh, finish for now. It was great and very, very interesting. Thank you very, very much. No problem. Thank you everyone who joined us uh, for this session. And uh, you, uh, you can uh, join us with our other session for this evening. Uh, it'll be amazing. And thank you very much for everyone. Thank you, Michael. Hope thank to you see you soon. Okay. Thank you Michael, see you soon in Tel Aviv. <laughs> thank you so much. After you should come early. <laughs> <laughs> well, after lockdown. Over, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, bye bye. Bye. bye.